Now, if you're anything like me, or most people for that matter, you hated math class. Obviously, I'm more of a history person, but then I stumbled across Pythagoras' cult. You know the guy whose theorem was treated like a holy symbol by the math teachers? Well, turns out, it actually was worshipped like a holy symbol. Stick with me, because it gets pretty wild. From worshipping numbers, to sacrifices and so forth, this may be one of the only interesting math-related stories. So with that, let's delve into what they didn't tell you in math class. You may or may not have heard of Pythagoras, but you've more than likely heard of and used his theorem. The Pythagorean theorem to be exact. You know the one that finds the third side of a triangle? Well, this theorem has been so important throughout history that it's still used today and still bears the name of its founder. But this isn't a math lesson, or even a history lesson on math. We don't care about that stuff. Now this guy Pythagoras was not your standard mathematician slash philosopher. While his name may be up there with the likes of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, Pythagoras, he had some, let's say, interesting ideas that set him apart from the other brilliant minds of the ancient Greek world. Pythagoras' work as one of the earliest philosophers inspired many of the world's greatest minds, including the Greek ones I just mentioned. His impact's been far-reaching and long-lasting, but it's the smaller, obscure stuff that we're going to talk about. Now, being that he lived an incredibly long time ago, and that much of his life and work wasn't recorded until many years after his death, much of what we know is ambiguous and shrouded in a bit of legend, so take that however you will. Pythagoras was born sometime around 570 BC on the Greek island of Samos. In his early life, he left Greece and would spend over 30 years studying in Egypt and Babylon. Pythagoras garnered acclaim for his discovery of the Pythagorean theorem and is said to have discovered that music is made up of numbers when broken down. For discoveries such as these, Pythagoras gained much influence. He was seen as immensely innovative for his time, and with his large support, he would begin to establish his first community, a community that would grow into a cult with some rather disturbing practices. Pythagoreanism is the lifestyle and ideology preached and practiced in these communes. Now, Pythagoreanism is a pretty broad term and an entire school of philosophy that has been altered throughout history and up until the modern times. And though this cult lifestyle may fall into part of that, the school has evolved throughout the centuries, becoming more mild and less outlandish. It's more in its early days, during Pythagoras' time, that we'll focus on. So what were these communes, and what was this lifestyle? Well, to answer that, first, let's discuss how you would join in the first place. It wasn't as simple as just signing up. As an initiate, first you would have to give over all your property, and then had to agree to a five-year trial period of complete silence. You would not be allowed to talk at any of the gatherings, and had to listen in complete silence to Pythagoras' speech as he was shielded by a linen screen away from the view of those not yet allowed in the inner circle. Of course, everything Pythagoras said was not allowed to be repeated outside the meetings, as it was treated with utmost secrecy. So if you were unable to make it through the trial period of five years, you would be dead to the community. Although you may have gotten twice the return on the value of your property you gave up, which, if true, is a nice consolation prize. However, if you were able to endure the five years of silence and not disobey any rules, you would be welcomed into the inner circle and actually get to see Pythagoras himself. Here you would be entrusted with the secrets of Pythagoras' work and advanced mathematical knowledge. And you're now a full-fledged member of one of the most powerful and influential political groups of the time. Okay, so you gained entry into the inner circle. Great. But what exactly does this all mean? Well, we'll get to that, but first we need to have some more rules hammered down. It wouldn't be a proper cult without them. A lot of the rules of the community revolve around dietary restrictions. A mainly vegetarian diet was to be expected. Later versions of this group practiced strict vegetarianism, but in its earliest form, you could eat the meat of animals that were to be sacrificed. Other rules include that you weren't allowed to break bread at the table, make sure to always keep salt on the table too, don't eat fish that's considered sacred, don't eat food that's fallen on the floor, no white roosters, and do not even think about eating fava beans. Okay, those are all oddly specific, but for what it's worth, they did have some sort of symbolic meaning. Bread was seen as a symbol of friendship, so that's why you couldn't break it. Salt, a symbol of what is just. And the eating of sacrificed meat was deemed okay, although Pythagoras had a rule to never kill living beings. Yeah, if you see the hypocrisy in that, you're not alone. Perhaps as a member, 
the worst thing you could do is eat fava beans or destroy or harm them. It's best just to refrain from coming into any contact whatsoever with them because beans, according to Pythagoras, were believed to take away one's soul and were in fact believed to contain the souls of ancestors, old souls reincarnated into a crop. Consuming beans was seen as the same as consuming dead relatives. This is one of the rules Pythagoras felt strongest about, and we will be coming back to it later. Members were also expected to practice abstinence, though something tells me that people in a math cult didn't have much to abstain from anyway. Anytime someone lost bodily fluids, it was seen as losing part of one's soul. At the very least, members were expected to abstain during the summer and could have the winter to give in to their desires. Sticking with the contradictory theme, members were also encouraged to have children to carry on their legacy and more importantly, continue worship. Okay, now that you know your life as the follower of Pythagoras with little joy, and if you have not been run off yet and are still with me, now you will get to find out what it is you will be practicing and mainly worshiping. And yes, there is going to be a lot of worshiping. Not just the traditional Greek gods, mind you. Th those are still to be worshipped. No, here you have an entire new pantheon to sacrifice your oxen, goats, and pigs to. But never lambs. Of course, never lambs. You see, traditional Greeks may worship Aphrodite for her beauty. But let me present to you a god even more beautiful. Even more perfect. Ten. Yes, ten. The number ten. It was seen as the greatest, most sacred of all the numbers. Here's a quick prayer you can expect to hear. O oh, bless us, divine number, thou who generated the gods and men. For the divine number begins with the profound, pure unity until it comes to the holy four. And then it begets the mother of all, the all-comprising, all-bounding, the firstborn, the never-swerving, the never-tiring, holy ten, key holder of all. Or something like that. So if you're going to go about worshipping numbers, 10 makes sense as the most sacred. Everything's based on 10s, you have 10 fingers, toes, okay, but the Pythagoreans had a deeper meaning behind it. It was the highest ordered number and contained the course for the entire universe. It was the foundation of which all things were founded on. This is seen in the holy symbol, the Tetrax, with a triangle with 10 points symbolized in the space within the universe. Yeah, I don't really see it either. While 10 may be the pinnacle of numbers, it wasn't the only number worthy of worship. We have a few other numbers to add to the pantheon. Nothing symbolizes justice more than number 8. And what could be wiser than the number 7? But let's not forget about the mighty number 1. Both even and odd. The undividable. The cosmic calm that gave way to the chaos of the universe, generating all numbers, and thus, the universe in which is derived from the numbers. Alright, let's move on. As you can tell, there's a lot of worshipping to do. Rituals, sacrifices, and rules to obey. But what's this all for? What are the beliefs had in this religious sect? Well, there's quite a lot here, and it's very philosophical and metaphysical. So in order to simplify it, I've broken the group's beliefs into three main parts. Friendship, spirituality, and knowledge. This is really brushing over things, but I think it provides a general understanding of what this community is all about. Friendship. One of the most sacred ideas was the importance of friendship. It's why you avoid breaking bread at the dinner table. You don't want to break the bonds of friendship. The brotherhood must remain strong. Unless there's an outsider, then there are no friends of the Pythagoreans. Spirituality. Congratulations, you're immortal by the way. Well, at least your soul is, but you'll be constantly reincarnated into another body of either humans or animals. This is why abstinence and staying away from beings is important. You'll lose a bit of your very soul, your essence. Also, it's immoral to harm other living beings, unless they're sacrificed to the gods, which is one of the most holy acts one can perform. And finally, knowledge. The greatest thing one can achieve is furthering the group's understanding of the universe. And being that the universe is made up of and derived from numbers and equations, mathematics can be used to further break down and decipher the universe. This is why new mathematical theorems call for an ox sacrifice. The gods must be praised for blessing the world with their divine knowledge. As you can tell, Pythagorean society is a deeply religious one. On that note, let's go back to the gods for a minute. So you have your traditional Olympiac gods, 
and the newly found number gods. But there is one more being worthy of worship, and while not entirely a god, you may as well worship him like one. I am of course speaking of the man, the myth, the legendary mathematician, Pythagoras himself. Pythagoras was seen as a demigod, quite literally the son of the sun, that being the god Apollo. Or maybe he was Apollo himself. Or in other stories, he's the son of Hermes, the messenger god, depending on who you ask or what story you hear. No matter which we choose though, his divineness was next level. He was so in touch with other beings, he could tame all sorts of animals such as bears with a simple pet or the sheer power of his voice. For you doubters, you could just take a glance at his golden thigh, proving his divinity. Or so the legends say. Needless to say, his followers thought very highly of him, and he did so as well. Pythagoras didn't just lead a fascinating life, he led fascinating lives. Via a gift from his father Hermes, he mastered the whole reincarnation thing. He could retain his memories from his previous lives. He could tell you many great stories, such as the time he and his buddy Achilles fought the Trojans. Throughout all his lifetimes, he had now reached his greatest form yet where he achieved unreached levels of knowledge through his numerous numerical discoveries. All this was taken very seriously, mind you, and one tale in particular really stands out due to its just sheer ludicrousy. You may have heard of irrational numbers. Numbers that can't be written in fraction form and go on forever. Never ending numbers, basically, such as the square root of two. There are the numbers on the calculator with like 15 sixes to just keep going. Well, they were a very important mathematical discoverer in their own right, and Pythagoras apparently wouldn't stand for it. The supposed founder of irrational numbers, Hippasus, who was originally a disciple of Pythagoras, had contradicted Pythagoras' teachings that numbers were whole. So how do two mathematicians resolve this problem? Pythagoras drowns him. He threw him off a boat and held his head underwater. Okay, so this is just a legend and it's probably not true, but... What may be true is that Pythagoras and his cult used this tale as a warning against those who defied their teachings. To be clear, most Greeks thought this whole commune thing with cult gatherings and number worshipping was extremely odd. They were always seen as crazy by most, but were able to go about their rituals without much protest. Pythagoras himself is said to have lived to be around the age 75, which is pretty good for ancient times. It's unclear how he met his end, and there are several different versions, all of which undoubtedly have a bit of myth tied to them, but I'll just tell the most popular story. That five years of silence while watching Pythagoras speak through a curtain was painstakingly long, and this poor guy just wanted to see his leader's face, so he did what anyone would do. He burned down Pythagoras' house. Pythagoras did manage to escape, but he was confronted by his old nemesis, or his old friends, the fava beans, a whole field of them. Rather than run through the field of ancient beings and crush them in the process, Pythagoras remained still and gave his life for the beings as the man slit his throat. Truly a heroic death. Obviously, a lot of this stuff must be taken with a very just grain of salt. Especially when it comes to Pythagoras' life. But regardless, it's an interesting topic and maybe it'll make you think a little differently about those boring math teachers. You have no idea what they really may be up to, and they might just have the secrets to the universe. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, I'd really appreciate it if you could like, share, and subscribe so we can grow this channel together. Let me know in the comments what you guys found strangest about this cult or any other creepy cults you may know about. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.